and welcome everyone. So it's Ray here, and I have a uh, new guest this time on the live video. I've previously done a bunch of these with Scott Keys. Uh, today we have Santosh Sanmuga, and he is uh, an amazing photographer, a great friend of mine. And uh, just to give you a, a little bit of info about him, recently he was just a finalist in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year contest in the black and white category. He had an amazing image that uh, maybe we'll bring up at some point and show you guys um, some some what kind of sharks were they Santosh? Uh, they were uh, Galapagos and sandbar sharks. Okay nice yeah uh, some really impressive stuff so uh, welcome Santosh. Uh, thank you Ray thanks uh, for having me and um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm so, looking forward to yeah, yeah, doing a talk I always wanted to do. Yeah, we have talked about this for quite a while, so it's nice to finally put it together. So uh, to jump right in, today we want to talk a little bit more about, a little bit more conceptual, I should say. Uh, the last few Facebook Live videos we have done have been a little bit more uh, technical oriented, uh, which is definitely good and certainly an important part of wildlife photography. But today we want to talk a little bit more about inspiration and kind of uh, what inspires us and what has kind of brought us to where we are as photographers these days. Um, you know, it's definitely been a long progression. I can, at least speaking for myself, uh, I'll ask Santosh in just a moment how long he's been doing this. But for myself, I've been doing wildlife photography for probably close to, I think, 12 years or so now. Um, and I would say only in the last maybe three, three years or so is when I really felt like I've had a handle on it and really kind of come into my style. And, um, you know, uh, tonight we're going to kind of talk about uh, a lot of the reasons and other photographers that kind of helped me get to where I am today. Uh, Santosh, how long have you been shooting? So I've been shooting uh, seriously for probably about three years now. So just just a baby com compared to you. But um, but I think like this topic on uh, inspiration is something that like everyone um, uses, like, but they might not really r realize that this is an important part in their progression as both an artist and a photographer. And I think that the more we realize, you know, how to pull, uh, how to like pull and drive our inspiration and where to find it and how to like harness that inspiration to further our own pursuits in photography, I think that'll help, that helps each, each person grow as a photographer and make a meaningful impact as both a storyteller and a conservationist and really like any, any, whatever their craft is, if it's, if it's like landscape or architecture, like inspiration is key. So I think it helps you grow as a, as a photographer in general. Yeah. And I think consciously recognizing that, um, you know, specifically maybe seeking out different inspiration and uh, maybe even areas outside of your normal uh, photography kind of realm um, can be important to kind of driving your style and kind of, uh, you know, uh, defining your style. So, you know, being yeah. conscious of the fact that you're looking for inspiration and trying to maybe drive your photography in a certain direction instead of just, especially with wildlife, I know I can speak for I think most wildlife photographers in the beginning, you just go out and take photos. That's kind of what you do. Um, and then at some point that hopefully transitions into creating photos, thinking about them a little bit more and putting a little bit more effort into making these photos happen versus just going out and pointing the camera at whatever you find. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start out here with um, this Flickr stream I have up on the screen and it's a friend of mine, Christian Hanold. He is um, a local photographer to me in the Philadelphia area. So that is how I was first kind of introduced to him uh, just by meeting online and seeing his images on Flickr and recognizing that they were in some of the same areas as, as me. And one of the things I noticed from the beginning of following his photography is his use of light. Um, you know, as, as I give a short scroll through some of these here, and then I'll bring up some that really kind of um, show off that, but he, he is always taking photographs that uh, utilize some of the best light. Um, and I know, you know, in talking to him, a big part of that is simply going out when the light is good, you know. Uh, Christian often will only go out, and this is a perfect example I'm showing on the screen right now, he will only go out and shoot when the light is uh, really good. He has the opportunity to be out multiple times a week, which definitely helps. Um, and 
just his ability to see that light and use it uh, properly has always been rather impressive to me. And I've always uh, just really enjoyed following that, his work because of that. Um, on top of a great use of light all the time, interesting compositions and, uh, you know, always technically great images certainly help. You know, uh, the images such as the one I'm showing right now, kind of zoom in on this, always tack sharp, always a lot of nice detail. Um, generally speaking, they're close, but they're not uh, what I know Santosh and I kind of loathe in the uh, wildlife photography industry lately, which is they're not cropped to death. So it's not just a headshot or just a bird or just, a, uh, you know, some wildlife crop to just that animal. It usually tends to include some surrounding habitat, as you see as I scroll through here. And uh, I know for me that was an important thing that I started consciously being aware of and moving towards uh, as I grew with my photography. Um, and I also want to mention uh, anybody in the comments as you guys are watching, please, please, uh, throw out some comments, ask questions if you have any as we're going along here. Um, so yeah, that this was, you know, really cool to find a local photographer and somebody that I could actually go out and shoot with occasionally and, um, you know, kind of pick his brain and learn a little bit more about that. And I think that's also a really big part of getting inspiration is, you know, not only following these amazing photographers that travel the world all over the place, but sometimes finding really uh, good photographers that you look up to that are local and you can meet in person and actually do some shooting together. Uh, I think that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction can actually really help a photographer grow as well. Uh, would you agree, Santosh? Yeah, definitely. And um, that's kind of the same thing that I want to talk about as well. So, Ray, if you can like pull up Matt Sullivan's Instagram. You got it. Yep. All right, he's up. He's on the screen here. Awesome. And uh, yes, Edwin, um, so we, uh, like one way I do derive a lot of my inspiration is I'll check out other people's portfolios and I kind of like, especially people that I look up to, I'll look at what they're doing with their images in terms of both technique and composition, but also what they're trying to do with the story, what they're trying to, what they're trying to tell through their images. And I kind of try and use that to mold how I approach my wildlife photography as well. Um, so yeah, that was a great question. Thanks for asking that. Certainly. So. Uh, Matt Sullivan, um, who's a photographer that we have on the screen here, is, an, is a real good friend of mine. He used to live in uh, New Jersey. Now he lives in the in the wilderness that is Los Angeles. <laughs> but um, I, I want to, I bring him up because um, I think having someone that you are close friends with that challenges you to become a better photographer, I think, is hugely underrated, and I think that helps you benefit. Um, and me and Ray do this all the time. We're pretty critical of each other's work, but uh, anyone that knows Matt Sullivan per, uh, personally knows that he can be very critical, <laughs> especially if you're good friends with him. Uh, and I think that's one of the best things that uh, I, I uh, that I that happened to my photography was being friends with Matt, is because whenever we go and shoot, we always share like what we what images we got, like what we're thinking, and um, he will. Uh, we both like bounce ideas off each other and we try and like tell each other whether it's a good idea or it's a bad idea and more often than not he tells me it's a crappy idea yep and that's how you learn <laughs> yeah it's how you learn and it's how you push yourself to do better and he'll i'll probably i'll go and try and shoot a subject and he'll be like oh well you know that's been shot like that a million other times you need to try and do something think of it differently will, for sure yeah me and separate yourself from other people and i think having a friend that both challenges you to do new things in terms of like uh, and uh, try, that pushes you to outside your um, like comfort zone and also is, provides good feedback. So if I if anything about my image is like technically off or he just doesn't like it, he'll Franco tell me he's like, I know I don't like that. No image hesitation there. Yeah. 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 And you also and then, have to respect that person, too, which is a nice thing about making those personal connections. You know, you can form that respectful bond and uh, when you get the critique from them, it means a lot more and you can uh, really take it to heart and put it to good use, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, because um, we always say that, you know, photography is about like what you want the images, but you're also trying to tell a story. And I'll touch up. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on. But with photography, you're trying to tell a story and your audience and how they perceive your images is super important. So having someone that's going to provide you honest and brutal feedback is extremely important. And it's 
even if it's it's a huge plus too when they try when they're like a good friend with of yours or a mentor or someone you look up that's willing to give them give you your uh, their time and expertise and tell you you know what you need to do differently and you know think about this or think about that or try and push outside your uh, comfort zone. And uh, Matt uh, did a huge uh, like he was kind of the reason I start I got into underwater photography as well because he he's uh, he's been diving since he was 16 and. I was I would see his underwater images for like years, and I'd be like, man, I just need to try that. And he finally lent lent me some of his gear, and I was hooked after that. And I ended up <laughs> spending a lot of money, <laughs> but you know, I, I I thank him a lot for that because I I probably never would have gotten into diving and underwater photography if it wasn't for him. And it's one of my favorite things to do now. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you mentioned a great point. I was just talking with someone the other day and telling them how, so, so Santosh and I, as well as I think five other, um, you know, East Coast photographers and actually one West Coast photographer have a ongoing Facebook chat group and we are constantly sharing images with each other. And I think it's one of my favorite things that any one of us can post what we may think is one of uh, our, you know, our better images to this group. And then almost instantly, someone else in the group will point out something that could have been done better. And that may sound a little rough from the outside, but, you know, being a part of this group, it really goes to what Santosh was just talking about and that we're all doing it because we're pushing each other to grow and get better as photographers. So uh, I personally actually love it when I post an image that I think is great on there and someone says, oh, you know what, maybe you should have thought about this in the background or try cropping it this way. And uh, more often than not, they are always correct. Sometimes I disagree and that's totally fine because I'm allowed to have my own opinion as are they. But uh, many times I completely see what they're talking about and I remember that and I apply it to the next time I'm out shooting. Yep, exactly. And uh, I think uh, Wes brought up a great um, yes. comment about using other types of photography to help with wildlife shots. And I think Ray has a really good example that he would he can use and talk about this. I certainly do. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's actually a topic, uh, you know, a specific point, Wes, that I wanted to talk about tonight. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how to word this other than, you know, I, I don't mean to sound like I inspired myself, but um, other than I... I pulled from another type of photography that I did and applied it towards my wildlife photography. So it wasn't necessarily inspiration as so much as learning from another type of photography. So uh, I make a living, uh, my wife and I are wedding photographers, so that's how I make my living. And um, you know, I actually learned a lot more of that before I ever learned wildlife photography. So. I can honestly say that a lot of the lighting techniques and composition techniques I learned in my uh, in my wedding photography have become very applicable to my wildlife photography. So, um, if you follow my photography closely, I'm sure you've noticed I tend to do a lot of uh, smaller in the frame. Uh, birds with a lot of space around them and the compositions I try to make interesting so I have them uh, usually heavily offset and uh, recently more recently I've been doing a lot of use of backlight which is a technique that I kind of you know learned and slightly perfected and I still have a ways to go but um, I, I learned and perfected that in my wedding photography and my portrait photography and I was able to take those learned techniques and apply them to uh, wildlife photography and I think that's just a, it's a really great point in that you can always take um, you know inspiration from other genres of photography and apply them even if they're not directly related there's almost always something you can pull from different aspects of photography and apply it to whatever it is you really like to shoot exactly in, um, yeah, go ahead. In, uh, sorry go ahead um, so yeah, Ray, um, uh, you can pull my um, my Flickr feed and go through it while um, while I talk. But yeah, for this, uh, the same yeah, let me do thing, that. like I've, I've like looked at um, a lot of like wide angle like landscape photography and kind of just like photojournalism as a whole, and kind of realized that uh, more than lately, you know, wide angle wide angle images can be ex especially powerful. And I've been trying to incorporate that more into my photography as well, especially kind of from the phone, photojournalism aspect when you can capture like a whole image as in terms of the environment, uh, what's going on with the animal 
if it's behavior, if it's a uh, like a human impact, if it's a if it's like a, a predation event. Um, wide angle photography is like especially um, powerful and potent, and I think that kind of looking at photojournalism and gleaning from that, and and looking at uh, even other like uh, wildlife photojournalists and conservation photographers that work for National Geographic and the BBC looking at their images and seeing that how how their wide angle images impact me personally i've tried to incorporate that more into my recent wildlife photography with doing more wide angle and uh images to hopefully get the same impact that they had on me and that, that i can have on my my viewers as well yeah certainly something i have not incorporated into mine but definitely want to uh the wide angle thing uh and i no, I haven't even tried it, but I just know already, especially just from talking to Santosh and uh, just kind of having an idea how that works. Obviously, doing wildlife or wide angle wildlife photography is no easy task. Um, you know, you talk about getting close with a 500 millimeter, try getting close with a 24 millimeter. It's a very different story. Yep. Um, I do want to answer another question. Edwin asks, will you guys ever do a stream where you would critique the viewers' images on stream? Uh, yeah, I think that is actually on our list of things to do. So, you know, definitely keep an eye out in the future for something like that. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, Chuck, you said nothing is in focus. Uh, I know the Facebook stream is not the best quality. So, um, you know, I think it might just be that. So if you're having trouble seeing it in good quality right now, maybe uh, just revisit. I'm going to post a higher quality version to YouTube after the fact, and uh, hopefully you can see everything a lot sharper and clearer there. And uh, Wes also makes a great point uh, that wide-angle lenses are a lot cheaper than the big ones, so the big telephoto. So that's a great point. Um, you just have to kind of know how to use them. And um, uh, Maybe you can talk about this, Santosh. Uh, it probably goes a lot more towards you have to really learn animals' behavior to be able to kind of get into their environment with them with a wide-angle lens. Yeah, you, you really do, and I think uh, it's a combination of like learning, learning uh, the animals' behavior and their you know their limits, their body language, because um, more more often than not nowadays too, I'm trying to do as have as little impact on animals as I can. You know, I don't want to completely disrupt whatever if you know if they're mating if they're breeding if they're feeding i don't want to disrupt and cost them a meal or a potential mate so i try and keep it as minimal impact as possible you know uh sneak in under darkness set up way in advance and then just wait and you know sometimes i get the image sometimes i don't um so I, there's an image i have on my uh flicker back if you want to go back Ray, yeah right about, there. yeah go for it what do you want the the underwater ducks ah yes yeah yeah the scalp so yeah so uh the scalp yeah so that was a image that um <laughs> yeah. i uh Love it. i had to kind of <laughs> i had uh, i shot that with a 15 millimeter fish eye and um i literally laid in about 50 degree water for about <laughs> 25 minutes before the ducks built up the courage to feed next to me so you know having a combination of patience and just being you know Determined. still and yeah, determined. I think that's another part of like wide angle photography. Um, and uh, I kind of want to talk also a little bit more about uh, inspiration as, as, and how it shaped me. Yeah, so, please do so. Yeah, so it, like I used to like, um, you know, like Ray said earlier, wildlife photography, I think a lot of people just want to be able to go out and get the image. And I think that's that's a, a valid goal and it's a reasonable goal because, you know, you can't control wildlife. It's, you know, you're at their, pretty much their mercy day in and day out. So just getting a technically great image is an achievement in itself. And it can be just with, fun to do that. Yeah, and it's, it can be extremely fun. But um, uh, I think like after a while of doing that, personally for me, I, I kind of got bored, to be honest. And, sure. you know, getting the, um, getting the same profile shots. Uh, because after a while, I, I found my good... Uh, I found I was able to like you know under like get get the technicalities of wildlife photography down. I understood light. I had my like go to locations, and I kind of got bored with it after a while. So I I got kind of found myself in a little bit of a slump about a year and a half ago. And uh, I think it wasn't until after I went on to Instagram, I made an Instagram account and started looking at some of the wildlife photographers I found. So um, there was another one, another guy that I really look up to. His name is Javier Asnar. If you want oh, yeah. to pull up his web. I got it. Uh, yeah, so look at Instagram pages 
and photo feeds of photographers like Javier and others, I think that kind of kicked me out of my slump because I was looking at how they were using light in totally different ways than I could ever imagine. You know, back then I didn't even dare to think of shooting into the sun with wildlife, yeah. let alone with uh, birds, you know, and shooting from different angles. You know, I, I only thought with birds back then, you know, I, you shoot at eye level and that's it. But, you know, he was shooting animals from straight top down, uh, especially snakes. He was shooting them from straight below them, all sorts of different compositions and lighting techniques and just kind of even the use of like slow shutter speeds and artistic blurs and wide angles. I think seeing another photographer use these other um, photographic techniques and uh, ideas and having it work in their photography and then me being personally impacted because I think his photos are absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And um, I think they they showcase the beauty of the wildlife he, photo uh, he photographs. And also they a lot of his images have like a good conservation um, message behind them, especially if you dig deeper into his website and kind of read about his projects. And I think kind of looking at photographers like Javier and others, it kind of kicked me out of my slump and realized, you know, hey, I can try and challenge myself with other techniques and try and master these. And I think that's a big thing that helped me um, push my photography forward because after I started trying to shoot into the sun and use different composition techniques, I think my my like love for wildlife photography really took off again. And I use some of those techniques in my um image that uh, was a finalist in the wildlife photographer of the year contest so i i shot pretty much straight down on a school of sharks do you have that, that on Flickr? yes that's on Flickr. let me get there you the go. link for i got it oh perfect yeah yeah so um there we go that's the image yeah so kind of like looking at how other photographers like javier were using uh this top-down aspect for shooting like reptiles and amphibians was kind of uh gave me the idea to do this in um when I dove with the sharks in Hawaii and um, it, it worked out in the end. So I think like going to look at other photographers and, you know, seeing them make images work with techniques that are challenging and something that you didn't ever consider. I think that's really important. Yeah, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, one of the things you pointed out is, you know, I think every photographer, no matter what genre of photography you, you are in, but especially in wildlife, you get to a point in your, you know, photography growth that you, like, like Santosh said, you are competent with your camera settings, all the technical stuff you're competent with, you have it down, you don't, you almost don't have to really think about it too much anymore, it just starts to become natural, and then when you're at that point, you can now start to look at other amazing inspirational photographers and start to kind of break down uh, the techniques or, or at least the possible techniques that they use, um, you know, and even if you don't nail it exactly, uh, you can say, all right, this was shot with a wider angle lens. This was shot with a really shallow depth of field or a little bit more depth of field. Uh, this was using backlight. This was obviously using slow shutter speed. All these sort of things, you can start to uh, deconstruct a photo. And when you can do that, then you can start understanding how you can apply those to your own photography. So, you know, that's, that's I think, part of the, the growth of a wildlife photographer is getting yourself to the point of where you do understand these technical things and then you can kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, rip them off from another photographer and uh, you know, use them in your own way. And I, I think that's a good, uh, that's a good um, comment, Ray, and I think that's really important because as a self-taught photographer myself, you know, I, I never, I never done a, workshop or a class or anything on photography. I pretty much bought a camera three, four years ago uh, and then learned how to shoot it and taught myself from there. And I think, you know, looking at other photographers and seeing their images that one worked for me because I do not know how my images impact people. But when I look at other photographers and seeing their images that, you know, personally impact me and I'm like, wow, that's a fantastic image. And then I know that, you know, there's something about an image that uh, will ca that captures the viewer, you know, whether it's the uh, the behavior or the composition or the animal itself, and then trying to deconstruct the image on how they got that shot from technique to positioning to light to you know just approaching the animal, and you know going working backwards was kind of how yeah. I taught myself. I, I attribute that greatly to where I am now today. 
And then I, I also want to say to any of you photographers that are listening now or watching and that may be a little bit more beginner and aren't quite to that point where you feel like you can competently deconstruct or understand how a photo is taken, don't be afraid to ask, you know. Um, I think many of these photographers enjoy teaching and sharing the techniques and maybe you send them a private message to ask and, you know, obviously don't start out with just trying to only gain something for yourself. Uh, compliment the photographer on their photo, that sort of thing, and politely ask. Um, you know, obviously many of them are busy and they may not have the time, but it can't hurt to simply ask sometimes and maybe you'll get the answer that can help you understand a little bit more about what went into the creation of a certain photo. Yeah, definitely. I've done a lot of that. I've reached out to a lot of photographers and asked them how they achieve this. And but especially with like lighting, lighting can be especially tricky to kind of because composition. I think for the most part, you can kind of get you know, hey, you know, the sure. animals looking into the frame or is yep. it looking out of the you know, looking out of the frame doesn't work for me. But when it looks into the frame, if it's big in the frame, that works for me. So that's kind of intuitive. But especially with like lighting and sometimes settings. Uh, in the past, I've asked, uh, reached out to photographers and asked, and more than more than more often than not, they've been willing to help. Sure. Um, I'm going to hop over to another portfolio real quick. This is uh, Ole Leoden, um, and this is a photographer I've been recently following on Instagram. And uh, compositionally, this stuff is just over the top. And for me, since that's where. I spend most of my time trying to get creative in my photography is with my compositions. Uh, having a photographer like this to follow and look up to has been a huge inspiration. And I'll just kind of scroll through a couple of these photos and you can see his use of, uh, and some of these aren't even necessarily specifically wide angle lenses. They're just, um, you know, being far away from the subject and uh, incorporating some amazing compositions. And, uh, you know, he has some amazing stuff that isn't just necessarily compositionally creative. You know, there's obviously incredible use of light. I'll pull this photo up right here. Uh, this points to backlight, which I certainly love doing. Um, and uh, it's a great use of that. But what really blows my mind from him is uh, simply stuff like this, where, uh, in my opinion on this one, my guess would be he is shooting through some foreground stuff here, which creates this darker area, more mysterious kind of thing. And then just including this entire tree instead of focusing in on just the bird in that case. Um, yeah, I love that image. Yeah, uh, here this walrus image I absolutely love. It's a you know an under over you know half underwater half over the water photograph of a walrus on the ice. And again, you know uh, I know this is something that Santosh is going to talk about, and maybe this will be a good segue. Um, but telling the story of the image. So if this photograph was just this walrus cropped in close here, uh, we would simply be seeing this is a walrus in a cold area probably. Uh, but seeing this composition of, you know, knowing, it, it almost feels like you're in the water with it because you can see underwater. And then including all of this ice, but doing it in a creatively compositional way uh, that really works, tells much more of a story for this photo than simply a close-up crop of this particular wildlife. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is that a good time for you to talk a little bit more about stories or did you have something else you want to yeah. talk about first? Yeah, definitely. yeah, no, definitely. So I think another thing about inspiration is that it helps you kind of define who you are as a photographer and what you want to do with your images, you know, and some, like there's nothing wrong with um, your intent as a photographer, whether you want to just capture uh, like, you know, the beauty of an individual animal or if you want to, you know, make a living off it and win contests, or if you want to, you know, work, uh, like start an NGO and tell a story and, you know, if work towards saving a species or a habitat, you know, those are all you, things you need to decide is what you want to do with your photography. And I think inspiration helps derive that and um, helps you figure out what, what kind of path you want to follow. And then it also helps you kind of figure out how to do that. And um, one of, uh, I want to bring up the, Instagram of uh, one of my absolute favorite photographers. His name's Paul Nicklin. So he's a, um, yeah, he's a Canadian photographer and he's a con co uh, contributing photographer to Nat Geo. And he specializes in uh, the polar regions of the world, the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic. And he's uh, really made his living as an underwater photographer as well. And him along with a couple of my other favorite photographers such as Brian Scary and Thomas Peshak. So these guys are storytellers and 
you know, I, 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 when I was young, I used to have like, I used to have a script, subscription to Nat Geo and I used to see, you know, Brian Scarry's and David Dubois images. These are underwater photographers that uh, have been working for Nat Geo for like 20 years. And, um, you know, I, when I was a little kid, I would see, read these articles, you know, on like, you know, the Great Barrier Reef or, you know, disappearing ice caps. And I would be captivated by these images, not just because that they're pretty images, but kind of the story they told me, you know, they, they kind of, they made me sad when I looked at these images because, you know, they were showcasing a, a problem that we have in the world today. And um, so they drew I, you in and made you want to learn more. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that um, lately that's kind of what uh, has been cap uh, captivating me again and kind of what, you know, in the future, what I want to do with my photography, you know, seeing images that cap cap captivated and drew me in not just because they're a pretty image, but a lot, lot of it because behind what the story is behind that image. So, you know, showing the plight of an animal or, you know, human interactions with animals and how they're causing this animal to decline or how they're saving this animal. And um, seeing how sim simply like a sequence of images can evoke such a strong emotional and uh, emotional response in myself that's kind of what I wanted to do with my photography. That's when that was kind of the re realization I had maybe about 10 months ago, 12 months ago is nice. that this, this is what I wanted to do with my images from now on out. So uh, going to like Paul's work, you know, he's done a lot of work for national geographic. He's, um, he's kind of uh, documented a lot of the disappearing ice caps in the polar regions, you know, the plight of um, the walruses and the narwhals in the Arctic. Um, he's documented, he made his name a long time ago documenting um, farmed salmon and actually how oh, wow. uh, how like how degrading to the environment farming salmon is and how it can um, it can negatively impact wild salmon stocks and like seeing how simple images um, can can make you want to like do more sure um, kind of drew me in and uh, like just kind of de again going back and deconstructing these images you know he has. He shoots a lot of wide angle where it kind of tells, you know, the story and he really only needs a caption, like a, a one sentence or two sentence caption. But just looking at the image, you can you could tell that, hey, you know, there's a polar bear that's floating on this tiny little piece of ice and surrounded by water. Hey, maybe you, you feel like, you know, the polar bear should be where there's more ice. Yeah. And then you guys, you know, hey, maybe the ice caps are melting or there's something you need to do about that. Or, you know, a photo of um, a salmon that has uh you know, it's back broken by a um, parasitic uh, infection that is acquired from farm salmon and how, you know, that can, how such a small, like, human um, uh, notion, like farming salmon, you know, we don't think about that every day, but how that can actually adversely impact, you know, wild far salmon stocks in the environment. And the, really the only way you can tell, you can tell these stories is through image, you know, sure. with words, oh, you know, people read words and then they get bored, but you know, they look at an image and they're like, wow, that's that somehow that impacts me emotionally. And it's also more memorable. Think, yeah, it's definitely more memorable. And like looking, finding images that impact you in the same way, um, I think will help you grow as a photographer, because whether it's a, it's, you know, a gorgeous profile shot of a duck or a shorebird or a songbird, or if it's, you know, the plight of um, deforestation in the Amazon, or if it's, you know, just absolutely amazing backlighting and creative composition and creative light find the images that impact you the most and then use that to shape the way you photograph i think that's kind of what i'm getting at here is that you know each each uh, aspect is important you know we need to have images that show the problems we have in today's world we need to have photojournalism we need to have images that show the showcase the beauty of the animal and then we sure. also need to have images that show art and kind of figure out what impacts you the most and then that, and then you can, if, if it impacts you the most, you're going to care about it and you're going to want to work hard at achieving that. So if, you know, using creative light and creative compositions is what uh, drives you the most, then that will shape the way you photograph in the future and you're going to work hard at achieving that. Or, if, you know, achieving perfect profile shots and perfect light is what uh, impacts you the most, then you're going to work hard at that. So I think, you know, finding a photographer or photographers that, their portfolio impacts you emotionally in a profound way. I think that'll help shape how you how you shoot in the future. 
And then, you know, please always certainly keep in mind that you don't necessarily always have to have a lofty goal with your wildlife photography. You know, yeah, if no, you no. are simply, you know, just using wildlife photography as an excuse or a reason to get you out in the outdoors and enjoying nature and uh, you just enjoy sharing what you've seen, that's certainly great. You know, you don't you don't necessarily have to take it further, but if you do want to take it further, that's kind of where we're heading in with our discussion today, you know, uh, the ways and the, the reasons and, um, you know, the availability of all this content online to use it as inspiration to take your photography to either A, the next level, or B, in a direction you'd like to go. Um, but, you know, yeah. don't ever feel pressured in that you have to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And as, as artists, I think uh, it's important because, you know, as artists, we always get into slumps and, you know, writers have writer's yeah. block, photographers, we have slumps. And, you know, if you if you never get in a slump, then props to you, my Yeah, speak. lucky you. <laughs> Yeah, never get into slump. I, uh, I can't. Like I, my mind's all over the place, and that doesn't work for me. But finding a um a portfolio or uh, photographers that inspire you and make you feel like wow, this these set of images really are truly phenomenal. I can't put a finger on why, but they really are. That'll help you drive, like. Help, it'll help kick you out of that slump because I've definitely been in the slump several times. I know before. you and I have talked about it. We've we've had discussions when we've been. Yeah, I'm in the slump right now. I haven't. I literally haven't touched my camera in three months. Oh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think I but, would. Uh, I definitely would have a problem with that. <laughs> so. Yeah. so it's um, yeah, like finding what actually like inspires you because we're talking about inspiration, right? Yeah. So finding what inspires you to shoot and then trying to figure out, you know, what about that inspires you? Is it the story? Is it just the art, art, the artistry? Is it the just the absolute beauty of the animal? Whatever inspires you the most, then follow that and try and emulate that and do everything you can, you know, try and work hard at getting close to the animals or try and find, you know, a worthwhile photo story that you can show to document the plight of an animal or, you know, go out and practice in like crappy light or shoot into the sun or play with the wide angle lens, who knows? But uh, yeah, but I said it's been three months since I've touched that camera. <laughs> I was actually going to go shoot yesterday with Ray or the day before yesterday. Yeah. And I spent one and a half hours before realizing I left my camera at home because I yeah. forgot that I don't, just forgot. <laughs> so yep. yeah, it's been a couple months, I've been one of those few months. Yeah. Um... I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here, if that's all right, unless you had anything else you wanted to finish with that one. No, Santosh. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, I know Santosh just talked a little bit about his, uh, you know, goals and the direction he would like to head with his photography. And for me personally, it's a little bit of a different goal. Um, I can certainly appreciate his goal with that. Uh, but for me right now, and this is certainly, you know, I, I say right now because with – your photography progression and at least for myself i think it kind of always goes this way um these goals can morph and change and you can be heading in one direction and then all of a sudden take a turn and go in a different direction so and in any case for me right now uh, my goal is to with, with wildlife photography is to really create um you know, beautiful images uh, and beautiful in a bunch of different ways, but mainly using uh, really interesting creative compositions and uh, really interesting, dramatic, different light. Um, and I want to point out this uh, gentleman, Kevin Morgan, who I follow on Instagram and um, this is his website. And I brought this up just because he has some of these portfolios contained and uh, the images are a little bit larger, but um, he, uh, I'm not sure how recent this project is. I think it's an ongoing project of his. Uh, and this is also something that I think is a great thing to find. You know, when I started realizing photographers were doing projects and putting a lot of effort into creating a collection of images that kind of go together uh, is, is a really interesting concept that I think a lot of, you know, wildlife photographers uh, don't necessarily ever do or try or apply themselves to. Uh, and it can be really rewarding. Uh, but in any case, uh, he took one of the most common easily photographed subjects, a Canada goose that can be found, you know, anywhere and are really easy to photograph. But generally speaking, you don't see a lot of amazing creative images of these birds. And he did an entire project on this, uh, this species and created some amazing imagery of these. Yeah, that's absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just such a common 
um, for, and I believe he did this in just like a local park, you know? Uh, so he didn't have to travel the world or go somewhere crazy and spend a ton of money to create an amazing collection of uh, wildlife images, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like who would think, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. these images are impressive, you know? There's not many people that have an image of many species that, that are the, this great, let alone such a, an average looking, common, uh, commonly overlooked species. So, um, you know, seeing that he did something like that was very inspirational to me and uh, has definitely has me currently thinking, I only, only found this re recently, uh, so it definitely has me currently thinking of trying to um, you know, create something like this myself. Obviously not going specifically after Canada geese, but coming up with some sort of project to create uh, mm -hmm. um, images. And I just wanted to pop back to this one real quick. Uh, this is one of the like uh, most impressive uses of backlight, I think, you know, just really dark, dramatic. And then just to have that really bright sun starburst kind of right where the beak is touching the water, I think is really special. So um, hey, that was all I wanted to talk about with that one. Uh, where did you like to, would you like to head next, Santos? Um, I think um, um, one of the challenges for inspiration is like how to find it and where to find it. So I think kind of maybe we can talk a little bit about how we Certainly. find this. You know, it's 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 pretty actually pretty simple. You know, it can be a challenge, but it can be the solution is actually pretty simple. So yeah, I troll yeah. I, I, I troll Instagram a lot. So like going through Instagram and just finding photographers that like that just. Just like, you know, a quick flick through their photo stream on Instagram, and I'm like, wow, this is phenomenal. And if that's the reaction I have, then I I follow them. Certainly. And, um, and uh, you know, in today's age, I think Instagram is absolutely amazing in terms of sharing images and video. And uh, I've found a lot of my Instagram, um, not my Instagram, a lot of my inspiration over the last year and a half through Instagram. Uh, even though I personally ha I haven't been as active as I'd like to, I definitely flip through Instagram almost daily to look at other photographers and what they're doing and try and find new source of inspiration. And, you know, um, Wes uh, shared back in, back in the chat earlier a, a photographer um, to check out. I forget his name. I'll, but I'll I, scroll back and see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, but I actually, while, while you were talking, right, yeah, and NR Floria, I, was, I checked out his Instagram and, like, like just stuff like that, like, I, as soon as I opened up his photo stream, I was like, wow, man, these are great images. And um, <laughs> nice. nice plug, Wes. Nice. And uh, uh, like, so just like seeing him, just going through Instagram, you know, Instagram has a great um, main feature page where they see images that you like and, and to try and match you up with other, other uh, users that have similar um, photos on their, on their, Instagram feed. So going through Instagram is one way. Another way I find inspiration is, um, especially for the more artistic side of things, um, I like to go look at the big uh, wildlife contests around the world. So two of my fav two of my favorite are uh, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, which is hosted by the, right now. Yeah, the Natural History Museum in London. This contest used to be hosted by the BBC. So I'm um, going through some of these contests, they're uh, gallery winners over the last several years. You can kind of see what images that have been, like, because these are all juried contests, right? They're all uh, juried by like big names in wildlife photography. They're juried by, you know, BBC and Nat Geo and, you know, impress the the accolades that the staff the juries have is impressive and keep so in mind with, just... yeah, sorry keep in mind with contest you know juried contests are very different than voted contests that are a little mm -hmm. bit more of a popularity contest uh and i yeah. i think both santosh and i would agree don't generally yield quite the high quality results that you would see from a quality juried contest so just wanted to drop that in there sorry yeah Exactly. And, you know, even the jury contest, you know, there's images that I see personally when I when I look at them, I'm like, man, why did that place? You know, I, I but, you know, that's the thing about photography. It's so Certainly. subjective. Certainly. And, uh, you know, what might not work for you works for someone else. And I think with the closest thing we can get to see what impacts people in general is looking at the results of a jury contest and prestigious contests such as Wildlife Photo Photo Photographer of the Year or um GDT, which is a um, European contest, uh, it's called, it's German, so it's Gesellschaft uh, Deutsche Tierphotographer, or something like that. <laughs> that was good, man. 
I'm impressed. Yeah, it's, uh, pretty much like it's a uh, like German wildlife photographer. That's what it stands for, or close to it. Um, it's a European contest, and looking at like what places in these contests in the past few years can really help you get an idea of you know what people are looking for as in general. You know, with creative lighting and uh, creative um, uh, compositions, and just like impact overall impact of an image. And uh, I think this is another big way I draw my inspiration is I go through these galleries because they have all their galleries in one place. It's easy to look through them and Certainly. see what works for me and then try and do that myself. And I've definitely seen stuff in here that, you know, I was like, wow, I want to do that. And I've tried, went out and tried to emulate that myself. And uh, other contests too, you know, there's, there's more than just these two contests. Um, uh, Nature's Best is a really popular one in the United States. Yep. Um, the Audubon has their own jury contest as well. Um, another one of my favorites are is Asferico, is A S F E R I C O, which is a Spanish contest, but it's an international. Oh, it's no. hosted in Spain, but it's an international contest. So, of of all the wildlife contests, my three favorites are GDT Wildlife Photographer of the Year and Asferico. But, um, you know, Nature's Best is another phenomenal one, Audubon. There's a couple of great underwater ones as well, so Underwater Photographer of the Year. Nice. Um, so these are all good ways to help find images that um, that both inspire you and also leave you scratching your head. And you can be like, like, like Scott said, some images will leave you scratching your head, and you'll be like, huh, why does that work? And either you think about it more, and you're like, oh, I guess, you know, they did this interesting thing, and that's maybe why... Uh, God recognition or you it just doesn't work for you and sometimes and, and it just doesn't happens. click with you yeah that, that's the way it is sometimes um, I do Working just want to mention real quick when you, uh, Santosh was talking about uh, you know finding these amazing photographers on Instagram uh, you know and in trying to continue to find additional photographers to follow on there a great way uh, to do that is to once you find one of these great photographers uh, click on the list of who they are following um, you yeah. know, if you like what they are doing, generally speaking, they will probably tend to follow other photographers that are similar or, you know, close to similar to what they do. And, uh, that can be a great way of expanding your, uh, you know, the list of who you follow and, and get inspired by. Yep. Cool, man. Um, I have these, uh, a, a few tabs that you gave me, uh, Sea Legacy and Tropical Herping. Um, anything yeah. specific you want to mention about those? Yeah, so, um, uh, those are NGOs that, you know, okay. people, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, we talk about inspiration. You don't always want, you don't, if you, if your goal is just to get out in nature and enjoy nature and take photos, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, some people, their goal is to go out and, you know, kind of uh, use their photography and use it because it's their livelihood, right? So they use it to try and make a difference by saving a species or a habitat. So Sea Legacy is, a, is the NGO founded by Paul Nicklin and okay. Christina Meyer, who is the, one of the founding fellows of the International League of Conservation Photographers. So they use their photography and videography to, um, to um, help save the... Uh, the ocean oceans around the world and it's okay. it's a great it's a great website to look through you know they have an instagram feed as well see legacy to look at what work they're doing with photos um tropical herping is a um another ngo that's uh, based down in uh south america and it's run by a group of great photographers and a, uh, a good personal friend of mine lucas uh busamente and uh you know they do the same thing they use their imagery to help conserve species and tell a story you know they do a lot of work documenting the different uh, reptiles and amphibians that are found in the tropical regions that's wonderful in South America and throughout the world and they've done a lot of work especially in Ecuador and Peru and Venezuela and um, they also hold photo tours too so if you uh, if you want to go out and yeah. how to photograph reptiles in amazing areas they hold absolutely phenomenal tours um, I don't have any um, I don't have any like monetary link to them so it's just a personal recommendation <laughs> I think fantastic for photographers I don't know I don't earn a cent from that plug so there you go. it's uh, nice. uh, 
uh, just a little disclaimer. Yeah, I just that, think that, that kind of applies to everything we talked about today. You know, yeah. um, you know, that we're certainly just doing these uh, Facebook Live videos just for fun mm -hmm. and because we kind of like sharing uh, what we really enjoy doing, which is wildlife photography. And uh, you know, I, mainly for me, it was just a re, uh, an excuse to kind of connect a little bit more with the community, which I know I personally over the years have lacked um, the ability to do. Uh, Partially just from my own, you know, lack of trying, but uh, you know, this was something that we wanted to keep trying. So, uh, you know, this is yeah. all just simply for fun, and uh, all these photographers yes. that we talked about and showed are simply just people that we have naturally found uh, over our years doing this that really inspire us. Yeah, yeah. So, like, if there's one thing I want, like, people should take away from this talk is that you know, inspiration is something that we all use whether we realize it or not. And it helps shape the way we grow and um, uh, like grow and behave as photographers. So find something that inspires you, whether it's like I talked about before, whether it's you know the technical aspect of photography or the art art aspect, the light, or if it's the storytelling. Find something that personally dr impacts you, and then run with it. Because the only way you're going to get better is if you challenge yourself and try and do some new things and try and grow and try and get better in your task right so like find something that impacts you and like try and learn how how they do how they get that like how how they make it work and then try and learn how to do that yourself and i think that's that's how i've used inspiration to pretty much teach, my, teach myself how to take wildlife photos and then you know now now i'm trying um i just started underwater photography about a year ago i started getting into landscapes this year too and i to be honest, I still suck at both underwater and landscape, <laughs> and I, it's, a, it's a fun challenge. But I've always enjoyed both of those things, and you know, underwater photography is now absolutely one of my favorite things to do. And um, even though I still suck at it, I still try and get better at it every day by looking at what personally draw, like inspires me, and then trying to emulate that and grow as a photographer. I think if if there's a, if you guys can just find something that inspires you, just spend you know, 30 minutes on Instagram after this talk or go on to, um, you know, National Geographic or look just through websites and or these uh, galleries on these contests and find something that that you're like, wow, this I don't know what about this image it just makes me, you know, I'm just absolutely in love with this image. So find find something like that and then and then start from there and then everything else will come naturally. Certainly. I, I couldn't have uh, stated it any better, Santosh. Um, mm -hmm. Real quick, I just want to mention uh, on the comments, if you guys have any questions, please ask us. I think we're going to wrap up in uh, the next couple minutes here, so now's a great time to throw any last-minute questions you have in there. And then, uh, you know, I also want to mention... Um, just to add to what Santosh was saying, uh, you know, one of the goals I'd like with this topic that we discussed is, um, you know, using inspiration to, if you have the desire to, uh, using it to grow and take yourself in a different direction. So, um, you know, if you have the desire to push yourself a little bit further, uh, you know, in the direction of more creative lighting, uh, more creative compositions, more storytelling, in any of those directions, um, you know, take that time to invest in searching and finding others' incredible photography so you can uh, apply that to yourself and, and kind of better yourself. So, you know, a little bit of time and effort put into searching out these amazing photographers and being coming inspired from them can have uh, a big impact on your photography. So it, it basically the point is it takes a little bit of work. It's not just, you know, oh, I looked at those photos for two minutes, um, you know, really try to deconstruct them and uh, take away the pieces that you want from them and apply that to your own photography. Yeah. And I think like if you're still trying to like perfect your uh, the technical aspect of the photography, photography, such as, you know, camera settings and using light i think looking at images that really inspire and capture you is a great way to learn and that's kind of what i did because i would find images that that i just absolutely loved and i would just go out and spend hours trying to get the same image you know pretty much copy the image that i saw but just on my own on my own accord and you know i l really learned how to use my camera and how to harness light by just doing that
And, you know, it's, it's a lot of like trial and error, but I think if you teach yourself how to, uh, if you teach yourself through that, it worked for me, you know, it might not work for everyone else, but I think um, that's a, uh, for a lot of people that might be uh, something that would be useful for them. Any, anybody that ever asks me how they can get better, my first instruction is always go out and shoot. Just shoot, 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 shoot. So, yeah, I completely agree with you, Santosh, that, uh, you know, the trial and error aspect of it um, is a huge part of learning. You know, uh, definitely this side of it, this spending this time, you know, looking at others' photographs and trying to deconstruct and learn from them is uh, a great way to push yourself further. Um, but that that is no... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's no replacement for getting out and actually putting those things into practice yourself and uh, trying these techniques that you think uh, may have been applied in a photo you saw from an amazing photographer and you go out and try them and it doesn't work and then you try it a little bit differently and then it doesn't work and then you try, finally try it a third or fourth time and then it does finally work and you figure it out. You know, you have to get out and shoot and apply these techniques and that is, of course, a, certainly a big part of it as well. Yeah, 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 Wes. Uh, I I know. I'm 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 going to be shooting Thursday down at Conowingo, and uh, yes, I haven't, I haven't been there. And uh, there's a bunch of us like, going to be down there having some fun. So yeah, yeah and then uh, I have a couple of trips down to uh, to do some diving this uh, winter time. Uh, so I'll I'll be shooting a lot more this winter. I have some personal personal projects I want, like photo photography projects I want to try and accomplish this winter in the local area, especially on like the Eastern shore and over New Jersey. So well, I'm, I'm going to be shooting a lot more this winter. I just got busy with work and whatnot. Life happens, man. Exactly. All right, cool. Um, Santosh, anything else you wanted to add to this before we wrap it up? Um, no, I hope everyone found this useful. You know, I know it wasn't much uh, in terms of like technical aspects and but I hope this, this talk inspires you guys and it'll help give you maybe a, a little additional push in your own photography, whether you just want to feel inspired again to get out in nature or try to improve your photography or whatever it may be, just uh, learn your camera better. So I feel Definitely. like this really transcend all those different uh, aspects and help you do a little bit better. Certainly, I agree. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining in. I want to thank you all who left comments for us to answer, as well as some of the complimentary comments. I really appreciate that. And uh, definitely stay tuned. Uh, we have a lot more concepts and ideas. I have a whole list of them. Um, probably definitely have Santosh back. I'll have Scott back. Uh, might even add some other photographers into the mix. So uh, definitely stay tuned for these announcements coming up in the near future. And um, uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Tim, thank you, Ray, for having me on. Certainly, man. It was really great to have you. I, uh, I think this one went really well. I'm happy with it. Awesome. All right, just stop it.